Welcome back, geology fans. I suggest you pull up Google Earth and explore the area around the town of Morrison, Colorado to enhance today's experience, kind of play along. My goal is to map out this area, get a cross section along this A to A prime transect, and then interpret the geologic history of this place. As I do my preliminary investigations, I note there is a good road cut exposure up Bear Creek Avenue, which I can start with to get a local stratigraphic column. Of course, in my preliminary internet investigations, I found this stratigraphic column already produced for the Morrison area, so that should be a big help. I can see that there is a north-south trend to the grain of the rocks. Uh, that the beds seem to be dipping to the east, and that differential erosion is creating a series of north-south trending ridges and valleys. The cross-section transect line from A to A prime is chosen to cut across this grain, perpendicular to the various beds. I go to the National Geologic Map Database, find my area, and copy the topographic map for my intended map area. Take that into Photoshop, turn it into a black and white base map, print it on cardboard paper, and make a couple of copies just in case. While at the National Geologic Map Database, I'll also grab the satellite image, which I could also get from Google Earth, but uh, also want to get the geologic map for the area from the National Geologic Map Database. I'm giving myself two days to get the field work for this project done, so I need to do as much preparation work as possible. On reconnaissance missions previously, I have flown drones over this area, and so I have a good sense of the lay of the land and where I can walk and where I can't walk, and where the probable formation boundaries might be, and good exposures. And though I can get a sense of the topographic profile of our transect line from the drone data, we'll get a topographic profile to start our cross-section the old-fashioned way with a topographic map, paper and pencil, or uh, Google Earth, as explained in episode 11. I have a few blank sheets to make my own strat column and have gotten all my equipment together. I'm ready to head out and my plan is to get the strat column done the first day and with any remaining time start following contacts to look for any structures present or this distinct ridge to look for any folding or faulting patterns. On my second day I will walk my transect from A to A prime and take as many measurements along that line as possible and then hit any locations of interest and walk out any uncertain contacts. From the material online I know that I will be skipping the Idaho Springs nice at the bottom and starting my exploration in the fountain formation red bed sediments and going up through the lions and then the lichens formation. So let's get out there. On the ground, the fountain formation is a very distinctive, poorly sorted conglomerate sandstone-siltstone mix, and I don't see good exposure to make a good strat column, so I am starting the strat column at the base of the lion's formation. But recent rockfall has blocked me from getting directly to the rock face of this section, so I will begin with strike and dip measurements on both sides of this fenced area, and getting rather consistent values. We will assume this area is also at that attitude. And you better believe I am putting this down in my field notebook and on my map. Now it's time for the Jacob staff, which we remember to tilt in the direction and angle of dip of these beds, which we know from research and observation are sedimentary layers. We start at the base of the lions, as close as we can get in, and site 1.5 meters up section. Uh, note where that is, because we're going to place the base of the Jacob staff there in a moment. But note this 1.5 meter section of the lions and start describing it in detail on the strat column. And then repeat. And this will get tedious, and so here's what I got as a result of a few hours of work. The fountain formation is a poorly sorted mix of conglomerate, coarse to find sandstone, and even this dark siltstone. It is cemented with hematite, which gives its red color all the way through. This allows us to say it is highly oxidized. It has rounded clasts and cross-bedded channel forms. Our most likely environment for this is an alluvial fan exposed to the air and variable flow from nearby mountains. Color changing from red to a more buff tanned yellows color lets us know we cross the boundary somewhere in here 
We'll try to narrow that down later. But now in the Lions, which is mostly sandstone, but has conglomerate in sections. Some parts are uniform fine sand, indicating a possible aeolian, that is windblown environment. Other parts with coarser and more variable sands or full-on conglomerates are clearly stream flow deposits. Uh, in both the stream flow and the aeolian deposits, we're seeing some cross bedding. Again, we change color going from the lions to the lichens formation, but now back to the reds. But in the lichens, much finer red material than fountain had. Lichens shows chicken wire structure of gypsum deposits that have dissolved out and very thin repeated layers that arch upward into dome shapes. And these effervesce with hydrochloric acid. Uh, stromatolites do all that, and so we feel the lichens is probably a shallow brackish, that is very salty, bay that hosted stromatolites. I find a nice place to break for lunch. And then, when ready, I walk this contact between the lions and lichens and confirm no major deformation beyond the tilted beds. Then I walk back out along this contact between the fountain and lions, measuring all the way, being sure to put all this in my field notebook and on my map, and... Hey, here's an exposure of the contact between the fountain and lions. Well, with that and seeing this blob as lions over here, I feel I can put this contact on my map right now and even provide some color. So, Next day out, I start at the A end of my transect and start heading towards A prime. I will need to be careful around the cliff edge created at the base of the lion's formation. I need to wander off my transect line to get over this cliff, but can collect enough data around there to be confident. I must be careful in these lion's layers, as we saw cross bedding. I am focusing on bounding surfaces to get the true strike and dip of the layers, but will take some cross bed measurements as well. I recognize where I am by certain features, such as the iron concretion nodules I saw at this level back on the road cut. I cross the formation boundary I walked along the day before and find the strike and dip are basically the same on either side. So even though it's hard to put my finger exactly on the boundary here to measure, we infer it's in this area with this attitude. We know we cross the boundary when we go from tan buff yellows sandstone conglomerate to red fine sand silt and even dirty limestone and can project from the road cut where this boundary must be. And here we reach the end of our transect. We've investigated before and know there's a shale down in that valley with very similar structure to all the beds we just crossed. I find a nice place for lunch, less likely to have ticks, and notice that my spot has some very interesting anhydrite stromatolytic material in the lichens. Maybe some kind of an ancient seasonal record from the warm wet times and cold dry times, and nice little stromatolite. Might have to collect these samples and take them back to the lab and get them cut. And ooh, teaching samples. During lunch, I put in all those contact leader lines on my cross section where I think I've located them. After lunch, I take a little more time to try to find those contacts exactly and not just put the dashed lines of, I guess, on our map. I might grab a few more joint cross bed and bedding measurements to get a good coverage on the map. I don't need a bunch of the same measurements in one tight area. Better to get a few in every area. When feeling I have good coverage, I sit down on this nice high spot where I can view everything and try to finish my map. I'm keen to note that the beds are dipping fairly steeply to the east and the drainage is to the east, and so we have some interesting V shapes down the valleys in our field area pointing to the east. Coloring the map in fully can be done later tonight over a beer as that doesn't take so much time as just patience. If I need to visit some location again to finish the map, I try to get that done and then walk back to the car along this ridge to get a good view of the site from either side. Depending on the season, I may have a cooler of juice packs waiting for me. I should probably head back to base camp and just start making dinner or off to the restaurant after perhaps having the courtesy of getting cleaned up for the public, but the rest of that night should be spent finishing your map and your cross-section while it's still fresh on your mind. And this wasn't the hardest map to do, so let's make it a little more professional using Adobe Illustrator. And let me go into this a little bit more depth. So open up Adobe Illustrator, and we're going to call this Morrison Map, and 
just to accept those dimensions. I guess if I had more time, I'd probably make that a more an 8x11 dimension. But we're going to import the aerial photo that I've been playing with uh, so far, and I want to enlarge it. But don't just grab a corner and start enlarging, because you can completely screw up all the dimensions on your aerial photo. So hold down Shift, and then enlarge, and get it on that edge, and then a shift and enlarge, and you will have your map enlarged and in proportion. Uh, so what we're gonna do here is make another layer, and I'm gonna make uh, this next layer the title, and we'll speed this up just a little bit. We're going to put in the name of the location, the name of the person doing it, the date of the, the map when it was made and any other pertinent information you might have. And with our title properly centered and everything spaced out right, uh, we will now go on to make the actual layers of the three layers, the fountain, the lions, and the lichens on our map. So we're going to make a new layer and label this one layers. But we're not going to just make the layers directly in this layer. We're going to make a sub-layer. This will become clear why we're doing this later on. So the first sublayer I'm going to call the fountain for the fountain formation. With the uh, fountain layer selected, I'm going to use the pen tool here. And I know this whole left side is fountain. Now we're going to start from one side of our map and move towards the other. You can go from right to left or left to right, but you'll understand the logic of this here and uh, towards the end. So uh, the fountain lion's contact goes right through here and across this area. So we're very careful making the exact contact between lions and lichens as we found it in the field. And then we're going to close that off and we are, like with our other maps, going to make the fountain a red color. And there you are. Uh, now I'm going to make another layer, but it's a sub-layer again. And this sub-layer will be the sub-layer for the lions formation. I'm going to use that pen tool again over there to draw out where you saw the lion's lichens contact. And the lion's lichens contact was a little more affected by the drainages here, so rule of these, we're seeing the uh, contact dip downstream on these stream channels as we go across them. So we have to be a little more careful as we're drawing out the lion's lichens contact. Now, when you get to the end of this lion's lichens contact and come back to close the loop so that you have an enclosed, uh, we're going to make it yellow in this case for lions, I don't really care about the left side. I'm going to just put it way back here so it's overlapping onto the fountain. Uh, we're going to make that one yellow as we did on our map. Nice bright yellow. And I don't care about that left side because I can drag the lions under the fountain. And there, the fountain where I very carefully made the contact is now the left side contact of this new sublayer that I made, the lions. So we have to make one last sublayer and label that the lichens. And the lichens is going to be drawn in a similar way. We're going to use the pen tool to uh, basically follow this tree line is where the uh, lichens and the Ralston Creek Shale, which we did not uh, take our time to map in this particular project, but uh, that contact goes right along that tree line basically with a little effects from the drainages again. As with our lion's formation, we don't really care about the left side, so we're going to be a little sloppy and be as quick as possible here. Just nail it across and close the loop. And again, we can just move the lichens underneath. Now, why do we make these sublayers into the big layer here? Well, uh, if I start just selecting the layers, big uh, upper layer, and have that activated, I can go to trans opacity or transparency, and I can start to make it transparent so I can see my aerial underneath. But it makes everything transparent without causing you to see the yellow under the red or the green under the yellow because they're all sub layers within that group that got made transparent and that's why we did it that way and you saw why we went to left to right so that we could be a little quicker sloppier on that one side where we didn't have to be so careful um, speed this last part up we of course need to make a key 
and so we're going to have a key we're gonna make little boxes which you can just copy and paste again so that they're the exact same size and, and well lined up uh, you make the key for the fountain the lions and the lichens and so you're going to color those boxes appropriately and use the text tool to write in their names use the line tool to draw in our north arrow and get that nice and pretty with a, an N for north and uh, we'll get that back and then I'll, I did paste this area over here on the road and know it's exactly uh, 0.1 kilometers and so I'm going to um, <laughs> I have to correct that it says one kilometer dear it's 0.1 kilometers across there and so we can make our scale bar if we move it down and put our <clears throat> point zero point one uh, kilometer marker on there and now we have our map in illustrator very professionally done uh, it looks very pretty you can import that into any other document uh, and so that's a nice tool to have under your belt I also write up a quick summary of the formations, their interpreted environments, the interpreted geologic history for this area. Alluvial fans of an ancient mountain range gave way to rivers and dunes as the land eroded down and seas rose up, and then we went completely underwater in a shallowish brackish bay with evaporite deposition and stromatolite fossils. But I'm going to do a much greater coverage for the Colorado Front Range in coming episodes, so I'll leave that for there. But I hope that gives you a general idea of how you might approach the mapping and data recording of a basic field site. When we come back next time, we'll look at some of the smartphone apps that are out there that might help you in all these steps we've talked about so far and more here on Earth Explorations.